Welcome again to the Rooks Out podcast. As always, I'm your host, Farouk Bello, and this is the second part of the conversation with Rachel Moses, who is the, a consultant respiratory physiotherapist based here in England. And in the first part, we were talking about how to destroy your lungs and all the negative things, you know, the different things that we're doing that actually negatively impact our lungs. And this part, we are focusing on the positive sides, the things that we can do to help ourselves, the things that society can do a lot better, especially relating to lung health, uh, the solutions for it. You know, in the first part, we're talking about, you know, different things like COVID, obesity. And now we're giving, you know, the positives, the how to go forward, as opposed to just leaving it all with doom and gloom to move forward. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. And, you know, Rachel gives us a wonderful closing segment and she just gives us a lot of tips on how to protect your lungs, being as she is quite in depth in this field, particularly. So, I hope you enjoy the podcast episode and without wasting your time again, I give you Rachel Moses. Okay, welcome back to the second part of the podcast episode with Rachel. She has given me more of her time, which I am everly grateful for, uh, for her still <laughs> carrying on this conversation. Now, the second part is the, the, the brighter side, I would say, the solutions, the, the looking ahead to the future of everything we've said, you know, and I will call this, you know, how to save your lungs. Uh, this is the theme of the podcast uh, segment we're going to discuss now. So uh, throw this question, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, uh, COVID-19, the uh, post, if, post effect. We've talked about asthma. We've talked about COPD and, you know, how real those are and what are the issues behind those. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what are the solutions? What are the management? What's the management? What's the treatment? Uh, how does it look? Is there a bright side or is it all just darkness and bleak? <laughs> but I know it's not. So that is what we're going to be discussing there. So the first question, uh, the first talking point I want to throw to you, Rachel, is we're talking about, let's pick up uh, COVID where we left off. I think we finished on COVID. You know, we talked, we we're talking about the long post COVID thing. So what as, you know, practitioners in healthcare, what, what are the options we have for treating people? What are we doing that, you know, can better the lives of people who are suffering from, for example, we're taking post COVID symptoms and what are we doing as someone like yourself? What, what can be done? So, so if we talk specifically about COVID, COVID, long COVID. Um, obviously, we're in a we're in a transitional point where we've just received funding for long COVID investment for one stop shop kind of clinics where you come in, you get diagnostics, you get referred on to whatever supportive intervention you might need. As, as physiotherapists, what can we do? Well, I do have to signpost to a couple of physio organisations here. Um, the first thing I'll say is that there is. A body of evidence grown and what the side effects and symptoms are of long COVID. But what we're seeing in some of the more specialist centres, for example, one centre in London has seen over a thousand long COVID patients. Um, we have had drips and drabs in other centres. Um, I think we've seen a couple of hundred here in my centre now. Um, these are the obviously non um, non ICU survivors. They're a different population of, of, of people. If we talk about the long COVID kind of community patients, and a lot of what we see with patients is that they've just been given the wrong advice initially. So it goes back to this advice public health message. So especially with the younger population being told just to get back to work, just to do graded exercise, just to get back on your feet and gradually increase your activity. When actually those patients who have more like a post viral fatigue, um, and we can't classify this as post viral fatigue syndrome because that's something that's normally diagnosed after six months or so. Um, actually it's rest, it's rest recuperation, it's good nutrition, it's good hydration, it's increasing your functional activities, it's keeping a, a um, cognition diary or a fatigue diary every hour, every two hours, not like rating how um, like active you feel, how well you feel, how fatigued you feel, and then looking if there's correlations throughout the day, looking as if there's activities that are making you more fatigued, because you have to just let this virus run its course you have to let your body recover from the virus. And then you start with what we call pacing exercises. That's when you can start with increased activity, go back to the activity over exercise. Um, and then obviously just continue to look after yourself. Okay. Things in that period, like smoking cessation, like if you are overweight or obese, identifying that was seen. Do you remember Boris? When Boris came out of hospital, and he'd obviously been told by his medical team, yeah. Boris, you've got to lose weight. Yeah. 
and he did and he said I'm losing weight I'm starting to I'm starting to exercise slowly I'm looking I'm eating better food that is a key That's message it. Okay, so th- these are the type of things that we can, this is the bright side of things that we can do and, you know, things to promote. And, you know, I can imagine we've, we've had this massive campaign. If you live in the, if you listen to this in uh, England, you know, there's been a massive campaign for, I don't know, it's, I forget the name specifically, better health or, uh, you know, pushing for a more healthier lifestyle. And yeah, really, in, if we're realistic, there is never anything like, I think sometimes people get bogged down by, you know, getting the best the perfect uh, health there is no such thing as you know perfect no one is ever perfectly in shape you can always be a little bit better and that's what you really should aim for there is no you know you get to this point and well that's the end you know i'm a perfect human being it doesn't doesn't work like that but you know pushing yourself every a little bit more and especially with things like covid because we're still as much as we don't like to believe it we're still in the in a in a health pandemic and in a health, big health uh, scare, you know, we're not out of the waters yet. And, you know, I think a lot of people, some people might think, you know, we're already done, but there are still people in the hospitals. There's still people suffering from these things. As we said, you know, it doesn't have to be while they're in the hospital. It might, it comes a bit why four months after is it's a long time. You would think, you know, but th- these are the realities. And these are some of the things that we're seeing that, you know, as Rachel just said, we can you do to help ourselves and help others around us. Now, if we talk about, um, you know, things like asthma and COPD, I can imagine, are, are they similar, you know, the treatments and the management for, uh, are they similar to COVID for asthma and the asthma and COPD? No, they couldn't be more different, really. Um, and this is why initially when they thought that long COVID or COVID survivors could fit into like a pulmonary rehab COPD model, we quickly realised that that wasn't actually appropriate. Um, and the, I just forgot to mention the Physios for ME website is really, really great. They have a lot of information. So Physios for ME and the ACPRC, so the Association of Chartered Physiotherapists and Respiratory Care, they're two of our professional bodies. They have really great information for anyone out there looking. So, and I don't do anything with them. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not affiliated to them, so I have no, no endorsement. That, I'll put their, I'll try um, to put their descriptions in the, in the, in the, in the. I'll put their, their links in the description because if it helps, it helps, and you don't have to be. Familiar. Yeah really good free resources and we have done myself i've done a podcast with physios who are suffering from long covid so that's um that's a really great i was really grateful for them to do that so if we talk about copd and asthma i really need to start at the beginning and one of the things we can do as healthcare professionals is look at diagnosis and what we often find is earlier diagnosis can lead to more effective treatment. And that's through spirometry. The only way you can diagnose COPD and asthma is through spirometry testing by a qualified, experienced physiologist. They are the best lung function technicians. And um, GPs do a really great job, but you need to get someone in the lab and you need to get good for pulmonary function tests. So if you are a physiotherapist in a clinic or wherever and people are explaining that they might have early onset like respiratory symptoms and they've never had spirometry, you need to refer them in, into a respiratory consultant or in for spirometry or back to the GP and say, I think this person needs pulmonary function tests. The reason for that is because there is often undiagnosed respiratory disease, often starting in younger years, and it's not until it becomes a real problem in some of the the interventions, the pharmacology that we would use isn't as effective in later stage lung disease. So what we're also, what the biggest thing that's happened, I can't remember, it's within the last five years, I can't remember exactly how long it was, is a lung screening program for all smokers. Okay or ex-smokers so regardless of your smoking um his, like your smoking status you get a ct scan in the amount of cancers and other things that these scans are picking up to prevent people from getting you know from dying is incredible yeah. so diagnostics and screening is really important then getting in the right pathway so if we take asthma asthma is a condition that kills it kills young people every day it's serious okay and in terms of money as i mentioned three billion pounds every year spent on asthma intervention now one of the things about asthma is it has a lot of symptoms um, that correlate to a condition called inducible laryngeal obstruction ilo you also have exercise induced laryngeal obstruction and what this is is a condition with the vocal cords where the vocal cords are always open in like a V shape like this. And when you talk, they move around a little bit together. 
and if you hold your breath most people think they're shut but they don't shut with everyone um but if you ever get short of breath and you ever you know get really breathless some people might have a little wheeze and a lot of the time people think that comes from the lungs but a lot of the time it can come from the upper airway in the voice box and because the presenting symptoms are shortness of breath and wheeze people get diagnosed with asthma when actually it's the voice box. So getting referred to a respiratory specialist can help diagnose and sometimes people get labeled with childhood asthma or exercise induced asthma. So you see all these athletes pumping their inhalers and never does anything for them. That's probably because they've got what we call ILO. Um, and there's a handful of centers around the UK. If anyone's interested in it, and um, there's a great team in Preston, in Manchester, here at the Brompton in London, Birmingham, Newcastle. Um, and it's fascinating because the way you diagnose is a little camera that goes up the nose, down into the back of the oral pharynx, um, and you down into the larynx, and you can see the voice box. And you do you 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 either get them on an exercise bike with the camera, so you can see them having an ILO attack or, or not. And the only way you know that if you diagnose. Mm. So in terms of how can we prevent some of this stuff? Well, as a physiotherapist, actually, if someone's describing these types of symptoms. Yeah but they don't have the other symptoms of asthma or they're using an inhaler and it's not effective. They're like, well, I've got a reliever and I use it, but it doesn't help. The GPs will often not ever see anyone. So it might be your space. That may be a whole podcast in itself for yourself because it's an, it's an amazing, it's amazing. So, um, then we'll have COPD. And again, the most important thing with COPD is prevention, but it's early testing. We have what we call a quality pyramid, Okay. So we, there's been so much research into COPD, which is technically an umbrella term of obstructive airway disease, most commonly caused by smoker, but can be caused by other um, other causes. Yeah. And the most cost effective intervention for COPD is flu vaccination. The second most cost effective intervention really? is smoke and cessation. The third, I'm sure, I hope I'm getting these in the right order, is pulmonary rehabilitation, right? And these are qualities. These are quality adjusted life years, um, evidence, highly evidence based interventions. Then you have your uh, it's inhalers, it's um, labbers, so long, long acting beta agonists, agonists, it's different inhaler types coming up. So um, with COPD prevention, but really simple things to help reduce the incidence of exacerbation yeah. and increase yeah. mortality that that is very interesting i would uh, you know you, did you see my face when uh, if it is listening i made a face when she said flu vaccines because i've that's something that's blown my mind right now I, I i wouldn't have put those straight two together as a you know prevention for uh, copd and I feel like i want it we can get to that hold but can you briefly quickly explain because that one is really uh, running in my head now so yes it's a combination of influenza and pneumococcal so okay. the pneumococcal vaccine um is normally lasts for 10 years you get your titers checked you get your levels checked okay. i think after 10 years um but yeah so it's basically preventing any viral illnesses because we know someone has a respiratory comorbidity if they catch a virus respiratory virus or a respiratory pneumonia they're more likely to become debilitated or die okay. so the mortality um rate is much higher so yeah so that's why it's a cost effective intervention because if you vaccinate people they're most likely they're much less likely to catch and therefore become more unwell okay. so it's the it's a multifactorial um, um evidence in it so yeah so this is why we are so keen on vaccines as a preventative yeah. measure um is clinicians yeah your flu jabs a very big push uh, I got mine, I think, last week. I uh, got my flu jab as well. And uh, let's talk about, um, you know, the, I don't know, it's, I don't know if homeopathic uh, is the right word. No, it's not homeopathic. You know, alter, alternate therapies, that's the word, uh, uh, that's a lot of uh, better word to use, you know. Things that, you know, like steam therapy and, you know, we talk fan therapy is a very, it's a very good uh, thing to have in a you know, therapist toolbox. And these other alternate therapies, what do you think of them and uh, how effective do you feel they are? And, you know, should we implement more of them? Are they, are they ones that, you know, are tried, true, and, te- tried, true and tested to be very good? And are they those who are, you know, you know, you can use them if you feel like, but it's on an individual personal basis. If it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, but are there ones that, you know, 
you would you would all often you know pull out your, your physio toolbox uh, when you're trying to when you're considering or I know some of these alternate therapies you know there's always debates around some of them being uh, as effective and they're always everything everything a lot of things can be debated so what do you think of these alternate therapies? Oh, yeah. I mean, some of it's just common sense. So you've mentioned steam inhalation. So in the old days, I say the old days, because it was probably about 18 years ago when I first worked on a thoracic ward, all the patients post-operative, the thoracic patients, so they had bits of lung out or they'd had, you know, they'd had um, like camera procedures in the lungs. They all used to get steam, heated steam inhalation. So that could just be a bowl of hot water with the head over it. Um, or there were like these little contraptions where it used to have a vapor. Um, and that was to help encourage expectoration so that the mucus to be coughed up much more easily because I had pain, they had an incision site. And that stopped because of an infection control um, issue. And um, I remember at the time when it was removed and with just as chest physios had to work so much harder to get this phlegm up. And I was like, wow. So um, I've always been a massive fan of adjuncts like that. And certainly in my clinics, like my clinic days as a consultant respiratory physio, um, that is something with neuromuscular patients or patients with a high secretion load that we would definitely advocate. And you can get things off the internet now if you don't want to use a Pyrex dish and a tea towel. Um, so are they effective? Absolutely effective. And sometimes with these, you just say, try it and say, don't use it as the sole treatment, use it as an adjunct. We'll have the sinus rinses. So I don't know if you've ever heard of um, there's If anyone wants to Google this, I'll write this down. It's the, the, the best videos are called Netty Pots. Is in N E T T I. And then pot, if you put that in YouTube, right. there's normally a, a quite young, attractive, brown haired lady who is the first to come up um, who demonstrates the neti pot. But it's basically like a jug that's designed to have like salty water in, and you, you put it on one nostril um, and tip your head to the side and pour the jug, and it r- rinses out your sinuses. The rationale behind that is because your nose traps all the bugs and you know, most people nasally breathe and it can really reduce your infection rate if you regularly rinse your sinuses out. So a lot of people with chronic cough, a lot of people who have are prone to infections do that and find a lot of benefit. Again, very little evidence, but it can reduce the rate of infection significantly for some people. We'll have things like Vicks Vapor Rub, you know, they put Vicks on their chest. Classic Vicks, classic Vicks, yeah. I mean, it is menthol. We know that menthol can um, have a you know vasodilation effect. We know when it's rubbed on skin, it makes it warm. It's a bit like the deep heat effect, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have have I got a problem with people using it? No, not at all. Um, is there some kind? Is there a placebo effect, or is there just a you know another effect? Probably. Um, and then we'll have the more we'll have you know for example, I'm a big fan of cannabinoids and cannabis and. Mm. I had a long history of working with MS patients and they would buy street cannabis or, you know, they'd have it delivered and they'd either smoke it or ingest it. Okay. Um, and the effects they had from cannabis in terms of pain relief, in terms of reducing their respiratory rate, um, you know, so that we can get cannabinoid spray drops now that are prescribed by mm-hmm. certain mainly neurologists, but I've got a lot of time for cannabinoids. Um, and then we have things like acupuncture and acupressure. I'm an acupuncturist and I've used it throughout my career um, with specific patients, um, either as a respiratory adjunct or for um, pain relief or relaxation um, to help people um, get in a calm state before sleep. And auricular acupuncture, ear acupuncture, it can be really effective with COPD patients. There's a point in the ear and you get a little plaster. It looks like a little circular plaster. It's got a little seed in. You can buy them off Amazon from China, dead cheap. And you push it into the auricular point with the, with the, 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 the last about five days, this, the plasters. And that can have a really dramatic effect on perceived breathlessness. Obviously, it doesn't physiologically reduce the breathlessness. It's perceived breathlessness. But yeah. you know what? If it works and it helps yeah. someone get more active. So a lot of my patients would say they could walk 10 metres, but with the seeds in, they could walk 50 metres. If it's placebo, I don't really care because it's working. It's, it's working. getting them more active. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's an interesting one. I mean, uh, 
But for each of all these, I can imagine you can go as much into depth as each of them, you know, uh, as, you know, acupuncture, cannabinoids, and that, those can all be whole lot other episodes and, you know, di- divulge deep in them. But I think those are, uh, you know, interesting because I'm always, I've always had the, the thoughts, you know, these alternate therapies and these alternate things, sometimes they're placebo, as you said. And, you know, placebo has its, uh, there are, you know, there are lots of questions behind, you know, the effects of placebo effects. I'm, I'm probably more on the side of if it's working for an individual person and, you know, if it's, as you know, pain is in the mind and if all these things, if it's working for you, you know, let it, let it keep working. I don't want to take away something, but you know, they, then you have to toe the line of some things are, you know, maybe not as good, but then, as you said, you know, if it's giving you the desired outcome that you want, you know, it's good. I think, as you said, walking, able to walk an extra 40 meters or go farther when they're doing, whether or not it's, changing much or you're doing something it's it's working for you and that's then the, that's the most important thing for the person in front of you and is it working or is it not but thank you a lot uh, rachel for these very uplifting words i hope that uh, that leads to the second part that we've just talked about has been able to you know for people listening you know show that you know it's not all doom and gloom and it's not all uh the end uh you know there's gonna be a future and there's gonna be a world post covid there's gonna be uh people like rachel are working hard and you know we're trying to provide content like this uh, for us so that we can learn and we can understand things a lot more easier so that, you know, going forward next year, hopefully we, the same, this time next year, it won't be the same, uh, same, same period that we're in next year. It'll be a lot brighter and things will be getting back. But I can, as probably Rachel could know, think, I think this type of events, you know, COVID and this whole year, and this is, a, this is actually probably a good time to start because this is closing of the year, you know, this everything that's happened this year is is changed to an extent fundamentally uh the way society works and you know we'll have to wait and see uh for how how much or how little it changes uh going forward but i'll let rachel say anything if you want to say anything to you know signing off uh to the people listening no i just suppose if there's any young aspiring physios out there um or newly qualified i should say not young um it just really respiratory is such a great area and it transects i know for, we're talking about some of the other podcasts and there's so many similarities across physiotherapy so really just get you know try everything out try all the specialities out i think the work you're doing is amazing because it's just highlighting things to people that they maybe never have thought about and this the our profession is so diverse so I love this space where we can all share stuff and learn from each other and you know credit to you for doing that brilliant thank you thanks a lot Rachel for coming on the show and you know I will leave for those who are listening if you if you I hope you've listened to this far the podcast episode I will leave uh, Rachel Rachel does have her podcast as well a podcast I'll put that in the description as well so you can check it out and I'll also put it on Twitter and I'll make sure to link so if you want to you know reach out you know ask her any questions I'm sure she's more happy to you know to help in any way she can and myself as well you know if you have any questions or anything we covered in the podcast episode you're not quite sure of or you want to know a little bit more feel free to reach out on you know at rook's health and i'll also put and okay, your what's your handle again rachel so so people can uh, people listening straight off at ahp leader dead dead easy <laughs> yeah hp leader i knew it uh, so it's feel free to reach out but uh thanks again for listening and thanks again for coming on the show rachel so i wish everyone have a good day until the next podcast episode uh the rooks health podcast